Gila and her colleagues for um, organising this trip. Uh, the, uh, thank you too to the ambassador for his welcome. Um, as he said, I did spend a few years as a diplomat, actually in Paris, uh, where I developed a very useful social skill, uh, which was a very, very well-developed capacity for drinking champagne without showing any visible side effects, um, which is, has stood me in good stead through life. Uh, but after three very pleasant years doing that, I decided it was time to get a job. Uh, so um, thereafter, I went to the uh, Treasury. I'm afraid the it's not the last thing that's going to provoke the ambassador, um, because as you may see up here, it actually says Paris uh, in the top right-hand corner, the home of Britain's traditional enemies, of course. Um, and at the moment, I'm actually teaching in the Paris School of International Affairs at Sciences Po. Um, and some of what I say to you uh, today will be taken from what I do there. Uh, in fact, it's my first visit uh, to Lithuania, I'm sorry to say. The nearest I came to Lithuania in my past life was that in 1966, I spent a week in a pioneer camp near the Estonian border, um, an experience which I still can't even think about without a sort of shiver going up my spine. Um, but that's the nearest I've been to Lithuania, and anyone who wants to know privately why on earth I should have happened to be in a pioneer camp in 1966, I can explain to you. Um, but I did think that this was a rather fascinating place uh, to visit at the moment, and rather hoped in the context of my own work on the Euro crisis and my teaching on the Euro crisis to learn quite a lot about how to recover from the financial crisis which you have done. Because one of the courses I teach at Sciences Po is about political economy of central banking and particularly on the ECB and the Eurozone and all that. And you, of course, engaged in a serious internal devaluation and are now back on a growth path. But on only Monday or Tuesday of this week, Tuesday I think it was, Martin Wolf in the Financial Times uh, had a long article explaining why the Baltics were not a lesson uh, to us. So actually I thought I would just call off my trip because, of course, if the Financial Times tells you um, that this is no use, then what on earth... Uh, are you doing here? However, I was pleased to discover in this morning's Financial Times a letter from Anders Usland, who at the Peterson Institute, um, who has said that Martin Wolf has got it all wrong um, and that the Baltics are in fact a lesson uh, to the rest of us um, in how to adjust. Uh, so that may be a part of the debate we have um, later. But I'm really going to take most of what I say this afternoon from another course that I teach at Sciences Po, which is about global financial regulation after the crisis. This is a course of 12 two-hour lectures in Paris, but don't worry, I promise you that today I will do it in no more than half the time. Um, so you can get uh, half a course credit uh, from Sciences Po for attending this afternoon's lecture. Now, just to show that I am slightly aware of what's gone on in this part of the world, um, this is what's happened, uh, happened to you in the crisis. Um, the red uh, are the growth rates from the end of 2003 up to the peak, and the black and being the average for the CEE on the top uh, and for Latvia, Estonia and Lithuania of the peak to trough collapse in the growth rate. So this is pretty uh, dramatic territory. Uh, in the UK, governments can rise and fall on minus half a percent here or there in the GDP, whereas here you had a major adjustment. And of course, uh, also in the UK, credit growth is a very big issue at the moment, where we are worried about extension of credit to small and medium-sized enterprises particularly. Uh, and you saw an absolutely astonishing collapse. This runs from 2005 to 2009, year on year credit growth. Uh, and you saw a terrific boom and then an absolutely vertiginous uh, collapse. Uh, this was a pretty uh, dramatic um, economic experiment. 
Um, and of course accompanied by uh, a significant change in house prices, not quite so much here as in Latvia and uh, Estonia, uh, but pretty serious. So what I'm going to try and do this afternoon as quickly as I can is ask what went wrong. Uh, where have we reached a broad consensus on an appropriate response to the problems that were revealed? And which major issues, in my view, remain unresolved? And I imagine that um, I will go from relatively uncontentious points at the beginning uh, to some probably more contentious points uh, near the end. Well, what went wrong? Well, overall, globally, we see we had a sharp uh, recession. Um, you were sharply, more sharply affected than most, uh, but this shows that the whole world GDP uh, collapsed in 99 and, of course, has been trending downwards again uh, more recently. And it's often rather forgotten when people analyze financial markets that this has really had a very bad effect on a lot of people who have lost their jobs. Um, and if you look at the number of people who lost jobs, and something like 35 million people lost their job between 2007 uh, and the end of 2009 um, around the world. And this is the sort of social and human cost of this crisis, which perhaps we don't spend enough time uh, talking about. And what is particularly dramatic is that we are finding it remarkably hard to recover. I mean, this is the uh, job losses um, as a percentage of the uh, previous employment peak in post-World War II recessions. Um, and this one is the current employment recession. And as you can see, this is pretty serious stuff. I mean, this is all of the other post-war recessions. You can see that employment, and this is 24 months here after, in practically every other case of recession, two years after it, you had got back to the same level of employment as you were before. And now we are still... Uh, a long, long way away from that. And if you want one chart that explains why the crisis remains potent politically, um, it's this, because we have simply not got the employment growth back uh, to compensate for this crisis. So this is remarkably serious. By a long, long way, as this chart vividly shows, the most serious recession we've had since 1945. Why is this? Well, um, recessions which begin in the financial sector tend to be more serious than others. And this is some work from Rogoff and Reinhardt. Uh, Rogoff and Reinhardt, so those of you who follow these things will know, somewhat controversial in the last couple of weeks because it turns out that while they are brilliant economists, they can't add up figures in the spreadsheet. Um, but nonetheless, I think their work on understanding why crises last a long time uh, is interesting and basically shows that a crisis that begins with an overstretch in the financial sector tends to be associated with sharper recessionary falls in output and also tends to be longer lasted as it takes a longer time to work off excess debt. An excess debt is what we've got. Um, and this shows total debt as a percentage of GDP in a number of countries running up actually to the end of 2011. And as you can see, the grey line here um, is the uh, Japanese. Um, and they were operating at an extremely high level of debt after their property boom and bust um, in the 80s, from which they have still not recovered, and this sort of shows the impact of their lost decade. But look here, and this is somewhere where uh, the ambassador can only applaud me. This is plucky Britain here. You know, we have rocketed up this league. Hear it for us. We are now top of the global total debt league. Who says the UK uh, is no longer a country of economic significance? We are right up there. Um, 
There's another slight consequence for the ambassador, which he may be slightly less welcome, and that's because of this huge increase in debt. That is why his salary has been frozen for the last three or four years, um, which is the case for every public sector uh, employee um, in, the, in the UK. Uh, there will be a collection box for the ambassador um, <laughs> on, the way, on the way out. Um, yeah. <laughs> so this um, shows that what actually um, happened is that from here you can see a big jump up in a number of countries where the private sector debt problem that was associated with the early phase of the crisis then sort of flipped into being a public sector debt problem as governments were required to bail out the financial sector. And so we replaced a private debt problem with a public debt uh, problem. And that is a pretty serious issue. Now, what are the underlying causes of this unpleasant set of phenomena? Well, I think that the broad lines of this story would be generally agreed, though people would give different weights uh, to these factors depending on their prejudices and uh, where they uh, sit, uh, whether they sit in banks or in governments or central banks. But we can see in retrospect that we had the build-up of large-scale global imbalances, large surpluses being run by some countries and large deficits by others. The surpluses in some countries, like China, were then recycled back into debt assets in countries like the US, which held down um, interest rates um, and which created a glut of liquidity. Um, why were people so ready uh, to borrow, for example, subprime mortgages? We rather forget that part of the story, given all of the more recent problems in the Eurozone, but that was the essential trigger for the crisis. Um, and I think that the Joe Stiglitz arguments that households in the US particularly tried to maintain their standard of living faced with stagnant wages by borrowing in order to finance consumption. So there was demand, ready demand for borrowing to finance consumption supplied by global liquidity coming into the US and bidding down the prices of, uh, of debt. Um, loose monetary policy at the same time, which led to mispricing of risk and which further inflated the credit bubble. I think it's reasonably well understood now that interest rates were held below their normal rate for too long. And, and this is probably the most important part, excess leverage that banks became highly leveraged, increased the availability of credit massively, facilitated by pro-cyclical regulation, at least by regulation which did not respond to this rapid growth in credit, and also by some regulatory arbitrage as people shuffled assets off their balance sheets in order to take advantage of easier capital requirements, etc., and magnified the creation of credit that way. And overall, we had excess unmanaged growth of the financial sector, including complex derivatives, which turned out to magnify risks rather than diversify them. I'm not going to go through each of these points in great detail, but this was what was happening to global current account balances with the oil exporters, the orange bar, and China, the blue bar, uh, and Japan, uh, offset by a large deficit uh, particularly in the US. And this grew, as you can see, very, very sharply from 2002 uh, to 2008. And then if we look at the financial sector, we can see what a rather ugly word, financialization. But this shows bank assets versus nominal GDP. So the dotted lines here are nominal GDP for the world and for Europe, the world a little bit higher but barely noticeable on this scale. And this is global bank assets, and that is European bank assets. So we had the financial sector just growing in a remarkable way, quite unrelated to growth 
in GDP. So compound annual growth rate of European bank assets of 19% a year from 1980 to 2007, um, and of European GDP, 5.9% uh, during that same period. So the extent to which GDP turned over within the financial sector grew very uh, dramatically. In Europe, at the early stages of this crisis, we tended to say that this was an American crisis. Whenever Gordon Brown spoke about the crisis, he used to say, this crisis was made in America. Uh, unfortunately, if you look at European banks, it doesn't really look like that. Um, I haven't got Swedbank on here, but I can probably find the figures if that would help you. Um, but, uh, you know, you've got Dendanska and Nordea, uh, at the top, but this is the assets of European listed banks just over a 20 year period. These banks expanded remarkably rapidly. And if you recall, this was at a time when in most of Europe, the growth was okay, but nothing dramatic. We had on average European growth of perhaps 2% during this period, but banking assets absolutely rocketed, uh, as did bank leverage. We saw an explosion of derivatives. These are interest rate swaps, foreign exchange swaps, credit default swaps, etc., um, many of which also had the effect of creating additional uh, credit. Uh, and just to show that it wasn't just about the financial sector, um, it was also household debt. Um, and the grey bars are the US and the purple bars are the UK, once again showing that the UK leading the world here um, in household debt um, as a percentage of GDP. So these were the long-term trends, global imbalances, rises in bank balance sheets and bank credit, rises in derivatives contracts generating other forms of credit, a household debt rising sharply, overall debt rising very sharply. And then we had the crisis, and I developed um, two or three years ago uh, a kind of framework which shows that you know, we British still do have a bit of culture. Um, those of you who have endured a lot of Shakespeare, I'm sure Shakespeare has played in Lithuania, um, all Shakespearean tragedies have five acts, um, as you know. Um, act 1, 2, and 3, there is a sort of exposition. Usually in Act 1, there is some dramatic event, like Hamlet seeing the ghost of his father, um, or King Lear handing out his property to his children, some dramatic event, a working through in Acts 2 and 3. In Act 4, there are usually bodies all over the stage. Um, uh, and then in Act 5, there is some form of, kind of resolution and perhaps a glimmer um, of hope. And in this case, we saw uh, the evolution of a Shakespearean tragedy. We had the subprime trigger, whereby the explosion of that subprime bubble suddenly caused a massive amount of repricing in the markets. People said, whoops, these assets are not worth what we thought they were. And then that created a wave of unsettling uncertainty and some sharp price collapses. We then faced a liquidity crisis. I mean, that can be dated very precisely to uh, August 2007, August the 9th, when suddenly the interbank market seized up. As everybody said, help. Um, we don't know where the losses are in the market, so we're not going to lend uh, to anybody. A gradual sort of unraveling as gradually it became clear that a number of banks were in serious trouble. This was when you know, Warren Buffett's famous phrase, you can't see, uh, it's not until the tide goes out that you can see who was swimming naked. And this was as the tide gradually went out and you discovered that there were a lot of banks who were swimming naked. And then we had the meltdown at the, around the time of the Lehman Brothers crisis and then the central banks began to pump money into the economy at a great rate. And this produces the helpful acronym SLUMP, which was um, what we got. Uh, and we are, unfortunately, still in Act 5. Normally, Act 5 in Shakespeare tragedies are quite short, and there is a resolution, and you can go off to the bar. But unfortunately, at the moment, we have been in Act 5 for rather a long time. This um, 
framework that I devised actually for a lecture in China was then in fact picked up by a playwright called David Hare um, at the National Theatre and produced a play called The Power of Yes in which this was the character playing me and in the middle of the play he kept coming on with a blackboard going through subprime liquidity UMP and showing where we were uh, in, the, in the crisis. The bad thing about it is that he's rather fat. Um, <laughs> in the first night party, my wife uh, met him and he said, well, how did you think I played your husband? And she said, he spends hours in the gym and now everybody in London thinks he's fat. <laughs> so he, couldn't, he was rather upset about it, um, actually. But anyway, so this framework, I think, is a helpful way of thinking about the way the crisis uh, evolved. Now, who's to blame? Well, uh, what do the British people think? Um, well, they think bankers. Um, but they also think governments and, to some extent, financial regulators, uh, Thatcher and Reagan's deregulatory reforms, but consumers borrowing too much, or everybody. But actually, bankers and governments um, are the people most to blame. The depressing thing about these surveys, I've actually made a, something of a survey of these surveys, is that there was one in the Boston Globe about two years ago which said that 32% of Americans said the people responsible for financial crisis were the Jews. <laughs> which um, shows that people search for the explanation they had in their mind um, already. Uh, the French think that it's American banks. Not European banks, American banks uh, in France. At least we think it's our banks uh, as well. But actually, of course, a complicated failure like this has many parents. And as I said, I think the macro imbalances, the loose monetary policy and financial innovation, very important, the rapid credit growth, but also within all this, badly managed and unscrupulous financial firms, undoubtedly, and, and this is where the academic community uh, has to stand up and take some of the blame. It looks to me quite clear that there were flawed assumptions about market efficiency and investor rationality. And this last one, borrowing a phrase from George Soros, um, we did have global finance, but without global government. Now, nobody, even Soros, doesn't think we're going to have a global government any time soon, but what he means by that is we had a market, a financial market, which was globalized, but with still rather balkanized financial regulation and different rules in different places, which could be arbitraged by uh, imaginative and perhaps unscrupulous firms. So all of these, I think, are part of the problem. Now, as I say, broadly, I think, although people might ascribe different weights to these different factors, probably you would get a broad consensus that this kind of picture um, was uh, appropriate. So in relation to that, what has changed, and then what do I think um, is still uh, in search of treatment? Well, we have overhauled, to some degree, the global regulatory system. I think it's true the system was uh, perceived to have failed in the run-up to crisis, uh, and if you look back, there were people who did warn of trouble ahead, who warned of this excess growth of credit, but who were broadly uh, ignored. Also, if you look back, you could see that something like Basel II, you know, the framework for bar bank capital, took a decade uh, to be developed. I was on the Basel Committee for a while, and so I share some blame for this, but there was a sense of timelessness about these discussions and debates among regulators, and no feeling that there was a urgency about creating uh, new solutions. The system was overcomplicated. There was no discipline, authority among the different bodies, different groups of regulators, and European ones, global ones, national ones, did not accept any kind of hierarchy of control and could operate uh, on their own timescales and in their own way. The membership of the global bodies was unrepresentative, 
and clearly out of date. Um, in the Basel Committee, in the run to the crisis, the Basel Committee had 13 members, 10 of which were European, setting the rules for the global financial system. This was absurd. Um, and it's not surprising that quite a lot of countries didn't feel particularly committed uh, to the rules that were put um, in place. The US was, in my view, excessively dominant in the financial system, and the EU did not respond to it very well by having 10 different members. So in the Basel Committee, if you had 10 different voices from the EU and one from the US, well, you know, the EU spent, we spent most of our time arguing amongst ourselves. That's what we do uh, in Europe. But it wasn't very helpful in terms of developing a coherent view. And as a result, the system left far too much scope for regulatory competition and for arbitrage. Now, some significant changes have been made. We've moved from the G7 as the governing body of global finance to the G20. Uh, and that means that far more countries in the globe are now involved and committed to the rules we are putting in place. The G20 uh, has been in existence since 1999. Um, it doesn't have much of a secretariat, but it is in fact now the key grouping which informs and populates all of the committees put in place to sort out uh, global regulation. The main consequence of this has been that an agreement globally has been reached to increase the amount of capital that banks must hold uh, to make them safer. And the Basel Committee, which I just mentioned, which sits uh, in the Tower of Basel um, in uh, Switzerland, um, which is the organisation which sets the rules for bank capital, has significantly strengthened the rules. And bankers uh, here will recognise this and may have somewhat mixed feelings about it because it has been a significant problem for many banks to raise the additional capital required. We now have something called Basel III, which involves a lot higher capital for banks, which also, crucially, would vary through the cycle so that as credit growth grew and as asset prices grew, banks would be required to hold more capital on the basis that perhaps there was more of a risk of a price adjustment that would threaten their earnings. Um, there will be additional capital for systemic firms, for the ones that are uh, regarded as crucial for the financial system as a whole, um, and also tougher rules on the quality of capital. Uh, I don't think we have time to get into precisely what that means, but banks were able to get away in the past with what you might call rather artificial increases uh, in capital using essentially debt instruments rather than pure equity. So this um, has been, I think, quite a significant change. Unfortunately, there are some implementation problems in different countries. The US, for example, is implementing Basel 2.5 at the moment, uh, something which they've invented uh, entirely for themselves. Uh, but broadly speaking, it's true to say that banks around the world have been required to increase their capital and should be broadly more robust um, in the future. We could argue about the detail all night long, uh, but broadly speaking, this has been a positive change. And in many other countries, um, regulation has been overhauled, in some cases involving changes to the structure of regulation, the different bodies responsible, in some cases strengthening the laws, and in some cases more about a change in attitude and a change in the confidence of the regulatory authorities and the central banks to challenge what's going on uh, in the markets. And indeed I think perhaps that is one of the most important features of the change that we have seen. Because in the past, and I can speak as someone who was a regulator, who was the UK regulator for eight years of UK banks, it is fair to say that the regulatory system was constructed on the assumption that financial firms had an incentive not to behave imprudently. And therefore, that you could, as a regulator, rely on the idea 
that firms themselves were trying to stay in business, uh, were trying to um, maintain their uh, integrity, were acting in the interests of their shareholders, and that that, is, that was the biggest guarantor, if you like, of a stable financial system. And that within the private sector, the control mechanisms in place were quite robust, by which I mean within banks, you know, the credit appraisal people who discipline the lending officers and the risk managers who discipline the credit appraisal people and the internal auditors who check what they're doing and the external auditors who come along and look at whether all the numbers make sense, that all of this was actually quite a robust system. Um, and that intrusive and rigorous regulation would be quite damaging and possibly quite costly in terms of foregone growth. And that basically the regulatory system should be a nudge here, a touch on the tiller there, and based on overseeing a system that essentially was regulating itself. And the people most associated with this um, were this man who is Greenspan, and uh, whose great guru uh, was, sorry? Rand. Rand, that's right, Ayn Rand, uh, originally um, a Russian, uh, who was um, his Greenspan's guru, and he wrote books uh, like Atlas Shrugged, um, you know, which was about you know, the sort of individual against, uh, against the system. Ayn Rand, by the way, I discovered, as I read a, a biography um, of her, um, was a remarkable woman with an amazing sort of control over people. And people still read, you know, Atlas Shrugged um, quite, quite a lot. Um, and um, she, she, however, in her own household, um, she forced her husband to wear a bell around his neck so that she knew where he was at all times. <laughs> Do not let the women here get any ideas about this, but I don't think it... Uh, but uh, she was a, a very remarkable person. But Greenspan um, was very much associated with this view that you could not sensibly intervene in financial markets. And I, if I was in one meeting with Greenspan, I was in 100, where he would say, look, you know, you're saying that this is going wrong, you're saying that credit's going too rapidly, but who are you to question the judgment of market participants who are trading at prices reached between themselves in a free and open market, who are the regulators to come in and say that that is wrong? And he, broadly speaking, said that the best we can do about financial crises is if they happen, we mop up after the event. Because if we try, as the authorities, to second-guess market pricing mechanisms, that will end in tears. Well... That philosophy has now gone um, rather out the window, and Ayn Rand and Alan Greenspan have been replaced by... Dodd-Frank. Yes, Dodd-Frank, that's right. There's Dodd and there's Frank. Um, and uh, the philosophy of Greenspan uh, has been turned completely on its head, and we now have the Dodd-Frank Act in the United States, which is 2,300 pages of legislation. So if number of pages of legislation is your guideline to success, then you know, this is a very important piece of regulation. But essentially, some major changes to the US system, some greater powers, and indeed more money for many regulators, very significant reforms of the Federal Reserve, and a completely different focus, and a completely different sort of balance of power, if you like, uh, between the regulators and regulated firms. There have been other comparable changes elsewhere. In the UK, for example, uh, the Bank of England has been given uh, a mass of new powers, a new financial policy committee with powers to vary capital requirements and indeed to require increases in deposit rates on mortgages, etc. Uh, the bank is now regulating all banks, plus insurance companies, plus everything else. Uh, this is um, a major uh, challenge for the Bank of England um, and is giving the governor uh, a headache um, as he tries to work out how on earth uh, to cope with this massive increase in power and responsibility. But Mervyn King is happy because he's only got two more months to go. Um, and so Mark Carney from Canada will have the problem of trying to make this new system work. <coughs> 
but as important probably as the structural changes in different countries are the attitudes to regulation, where in the past politicians used to talk and praise the regulatory system as being a light touch system. Our politicians did so on many occasions. So what we're putting in place is a light touch system. Now you get good headlines if you say what we're putting in place is an intrusive system. We used to say, our politicians used to say, the key thing is the competitiveness of our financial centre. You know, we want to attract business to our financial centre. Now they ask if it's a price worth paying, you know, that actually if you attract these firms, you know, maybe they blow up in your face. And do you really want uh, to be the owner, the proud owner of a massive financial centre uh, that may explode? Um, in the past, regulators basically said, it's okay unless we say it's not. And now they say, it's not okay unless we say it is. Um, so that if you want to introduce new products, um, now in the financial firms, essentially, you're better off go to the regulator and ask if this is okay. In the past, people would launch new things and regulators might catch up subsequently and say they didn't like them, but they weren't involved in pre-approval. Now they are. And as far as people working in the financial sector, and this is, this is a horrific development for bankers, in the past, the controls exercised by regulators were really about whether you were fit and proper to run a bank. And that really meant, had you been in jail, well, recently, you know. <laughs> um, if not, you were probably okay. Now, and this is shocking to any banker, the regulators are actually asking them if they know anything about what they're doing which is pretty horrible, really, to unfair uh, to ask a banker if they actually know about their uh, banking. But, you know, it's shocking. I know you'll be shocked to know that, but that's what regulators are now, uh, are now doing. Um, and so this change in the culture of regulation has been quite significant and I think probably is as important as the structural changes and as the precise amounts of capital that banks are required to hold. So let us not underestimate what has been done in response to the crisis. But I want to end by highlighting what I see as three issues um, where I think we have not yet got a solution and where I think a solution needs to be found. And the first is the problem of too big to fail. Now we all know the problem with um, ships um, as well as banks that are too big to fail, um, is that sometimes, nonetheless, they do, uh, whether it's the Titanic um, or whether uh, it's Royal Bank of Scotland. And what do you do about this problem? And this has come to the fore because the amount of money governments have spent bailing out the financial system are in some countries very large uh, indeed. This is you know, percent um, of GDP and the Irish you know, have spent more than 50% um, of GDP on a combination of, of asset relief, recapitalization, the blue boxes and guarantees as well. These have been very large um, numbers and the total aid um, of, from the public sector to the banking system in the EU by the end of last year was 1.6 trillion euros which is, you know, hey, a trillion here, a trillion there, and pretty soon you are talking real money. Um, the, and this is something which is focusing the minds. And this has been done because governments felt that the institutions were simply too significant to be allowed to fail, and therefore governments had to bail them out. Now, moral hazard is at the heart of the too-big-to-fail Problem. Um, Paul Krugman defines moral hazard as being a situation in which one person makes the decision about how much risk to take, while someone else bears the cost if things go bad. And the problem is that in banking, you can typically increase your profit and therefore the remuneration for yourself by increasing your loan book and by taking on riskier loans and higher leverage. And in the bad times, taxpayers will bail out banks to avoid the adverse economic and social consequences of bank failures. And this is a version of the old adage that if you owe the bank a million, a 
a hundred pounds, it's your problem. If you owe the bank a million pounds, it's the bank's problem. Um, and in a sense, it's that if the banks lose small amounts of money, it's their problem. If they lose very large amounts of money, it turns out to be the government's problem um, because they can't allow them to, to go bust. Now, we have tried to deal with this issue in the past, but not very successfully. In a sense, capital requirements are an attempt to deal with this, to try to minimise the risk of institutional failure. But they didn't work terribly well in the run-up to the crisis, as we have seen. And the danger, of course, is that you can, in fact, encourage riskier lending if you reduce a bank's ability to take on leverage. Because in order to maintain its earnings, it may then take on stand. We tried supervising risk-taking by regulators. Well, that didn't turn out to be very effective. Supervisors didn't know enough about it and perhaps cannot ever be expected to know enough about it unless we have armies of them who are paid as well as the bankers are paid. Um, we tried constructive ambiguity, by which I mean that you would never say that there was a bank that you would bail out and therefore the market was <laughs> left in doubt and therefore that disciplined the market. But unfortunately, once central banks have been forced to intervene, it's difficult for them then to say they won't in the future, and they're not really believed. We've tried by controlling incentives and compensation, and that's not proved terribly effective, and it's hard to do um, in, unless you become a kind of director of the bank. So now, there are a number of more radical ideas, and this is very real time, this is a lively debate at the moment, a new bill in fact was introduced into Congress just this week uh, to try to deal with this problem. So it's not at all clear how it will all turn out. But you have the Volcker Rule, which restricts proprietary trading. In other words, says that big banks are not allowed to gamble with their own money, but that only affects a rather small part of what they do. We have proposals to ring fence retail activities and say, look, if the case for intervening to support banks is because you can't allow ordinary depositors uh, and indeed small businesses to be without a bank, then perhaps you should restrict your support to that part of the bank and say, we ring fence that bit and we will support it, but we will not actually support broader banks taking on greater risks. Question with that is, is it credible? And does it actually create safer banks or does it reduce the ability of banks to diversify and therefore makes them actually less robust? There are proposals to enforce a complete separation of retail business and small business lending uh, from others. Uh, for example, in the UK there's something called the Vickers Report. In the EU more broadly there was the Likkonen uh, Report. Uh, Likkonen, the governor of the Bank of Finland, who produced a report arguing for something rather similar. And then some people go even as far as saying, well, let's limit public support to narrow banks. And that means banks that are just performing the core bits of the financial system, providing a payment system, you know, allowing your credit cards to settle with each other, etc. Um, but not banks that are engaged in any form of riskier lending. The difficulty of that is increases the risk um, for the rest of the system and may raise credit costs for all other borrowers. Frankly, we don't know where we're going on this. The US is currently going off in a Volcker direction. The UK is going off in a Vickers direction, which is quite different. The EU may be going in a Likkonen direction, but actually the French have decided on something else um, and the Germans don't seem to show much enthusiasm for it. This is a mess. And I think that a global solution to the too-big-to-fail problem is one which we really need to find. The second big unresolved issue is the question of, well, linked question of ethics and rewards in banking. Um, here's a question. Um, how much was Lloyd Blankfein paid in 2007? Remember 2007 was the big year when the big collapse in um, subprime happened, which affected the investment banks. Uh, so that was the first year that they were hit. Uh, so how much was he paid? 
Yes. Yes. Yeah. 54 was right. Well done. Yeah. Usually people think the right answer is bound to be 73, which is outrageous. How could a man be paid 73 million? You know, honestly. <laughs> but 54 is completely right. Um, obviously, uh, he was worth it. But um, the problem of private sector of pay in banking is an interesting one. Um, and this shows what's called the historical excess wage in the financial sector, by which it means uh, the wages above the average for skill-adjusted, actually, skill-adjusted wages. Um, and you can see that after a long period when financial sector pay in the US really roughly tracked everybody else's, from about 1990, it rocketed um, in a remarkable, remarkable way. Um, and we still not really got to the bottom of why this has happened or what justification there can be uh, for it. And in fact, investment banks in particular, but also hedge funds and others, start to look like sort of workers' cooperatives, really. Um, in other words, where all the returns are paid out to the workers. Um, indeed, there is only one category of institution you can find where more of the profits, or indeed, well, rev never mind profits, more of the revenues are paid out to the workers than in investment banks. Does anybody think which... Ca Sorry? Yes, not bad. Not bad. Premier League football clubs. Um, and if you look, uh, this is, Portsmouth is slightly unusual because it was paid, it was supported at the time by a strange Russian who turned out not to have any money at all. But um, Manchester City, which I confess is my own team, uh, paid uh, 90, over 90% 90 of its revenues um, out to uh, its players. In Newcastle United, over 80. And only UBS among the uh, banks really got anywhere into this Premier League at all. Uh, and the, you know, they were sixth, so, so they wouldn't have been even in the Europa League. Um, uh, as a result. But it, it is interesting that these firms have got into the position where they just pay out an absolutely huge amount of their revenues and are paying way above what seems to be justified in relation to the rest of the economy. Now why is this? Well, some people say because job security is not that high. Uh, these are people leaving Lehman Brothers uh, in London in uh, 2008. But it doesn't look as though that is enough to explain this excess rent that the financial sector appears to be able to secure. Now then, of course, you have to say, well, even if they are paid a lot, why should we care? You know, why don't we just say, well, hey, the lesson for this is we should get a job in a bank. Um, and that this is not... Uh, something for the public sector. Well, why should we care? Well, I think we should care because incentive payments can divide, drive risk-seeking behaviour which causes institutional failure, financial instability and imposes costs on taxpayers. And certainly, some of the taxpayer support for the financial sector has effectively gone to very highly paid people. Bluntly, this is just a fact. Uh, and that does not make politicians or voters feel particularly happy. Um, also, of course, if you see this kind of behaviour, it may be a symptom of other competitive or regulatory problems. I mean, it may suggest uh, that the barriers to entry in this industry are too high, because normally you would expect that excess returns of this kind would be bid away by new people entering the market. So you have to ask yourself, are we creating uh, barriers to entry which are having the effect of protecting the incumbents and allowing them to take out uh, large returns? Also, not everybody would agree with this point, uh, but I think it's important, is that growing income inequality of this kind uh, may well contribute to social resentment and instability. And I think you do see that uh, in some in some countries. So I think you have to care about this issue. What can you do about it? Well, there are five things people are trying to do. One is transparency. 
naming and shaming. The problem is that many of these people think it's great that they're in the papers revealed to be earning £8 million. Pounds. They think that's terrific. Uh, so the naming and shaming has not been enormously effective. Uh, you can impose some regulatory controls on incentive structures. And it's having some effect. Um, you are required now, I chair two risk committees in financial institutions, and you are required now as the risk committee to look at the compensation structures and say, is there anything about the compensation structures that is actually driving risk-seeking behaviour that you are attempting to control through your risk management? It's plausible as an argument. Um, it's quite difficult to do. Uh, and I speak as someone who's been trying for a few years to do it. It's quite difficult uh, to police that kind of interface. Empowering shareholders to control management has been done and is having some effect. This roughly goes under the heading of say on pay um, in the US anyway. Actually, it was started in the UK, in fact, whereby you require firms to put their remuneration policies to a shareholder vote and the shareholders can vote them down specifically. They don't just have to vote the chairman out, they can vote against the remuneration policies. Um, you can just simply impose higher marginal tax rates or pay-related levies, and this has been done in the UK. The government increased the marginal tax rate, I mean largely for this reason, um, and indeed imposed an additional bonus tax. So for bonuses above a certain level, you are required to pay the same again in an additional tax uh, to the government. This had some effect, and I'm slightly surprised that other countries have not gone in that direction, actually. In theory, you could also impose direct limits on remuneration. This is the latest plan um, by the European Parliament, which says that bonuses must be limited to one times salary. Personally, I'm not enthusiastic about this plan, because what it's essentially doing is driving up salary as opposed to bonus and making firms have uh, increasing their fixed cost base rather than their variable costs uh, because you can only pay one time salary as bonus so you increase salary um, and that gives you a higher fixed cost base so I'm not sure that's a smart move um, at all how effective have all of this been well uh, the top levels have fallen the top traders now at Goldman used to get $40 million, and now they get between 15 and 20. Now, that's a fact, and it's an interesting fact, but oddly, not many politicians have chosen to use that in a speech as a sign of success of their policies. Because to say, you know, look, these guys are only getting paid $18 million now, so look how successful I have been, doesn't seem to work. Uh, so although it has had an effect, it hasn't had enough of an effect. Senior executives have taken pay cuts, though largely because profitability is down. One consequence, of course, which you might less welcome, is that essentially you're moving activities across institutional borders. You know, if you really want to make money these days, you don't go to an investment bank, you go to a hedge fund or a private equity firm because that's where you know, you're in an unregulated or less regulated environment, not public companies typically, so they don't have the disclosure. So you're shifting risk-taking activities outside the regulated frontier. Is this a good idea? It's not clear. Um, and it will require authorities to be very ballsy about not rescuing other institutions outside the regulated frontier um, if they cause trouble. So I'm not quite clear that this is a very good idea. And I think that, unfortunately, financial sector rewards still remain uh, remarkably high. And I don't think that we have fully solved this problem either. The third and last point um, is the EMU uh, dilemma, uh, or perhaps the EMU uh, trilemma. I'm going to be quite brief about this, because otherwise we could spend the rest of the night on it. But roughly... The problem is that you have an interdependence between banks and sovereigns, and that's problematic when the sovereigns, as in the case of Greece or Cyprus, are essentially not able to borrow independently themselves, and so they're not able to support their own banks. You have a rule on no monetary financing. You have the ECB 
precluded by the Maastricht Treaty from providing monetary financing of governments from buying government debt in the primary market, uh, and you have no co-responsibility for public debt in the European Union. Um, and it's not clear that you can have these three things together and have a stable financial system. So far, in trying to resolve this problem, um, EU leaders have rejected mutually guaranteed borrowing. Uh, the Germans have been very firm that they're not going to have euro bonds, which are collectively guaranteed. They've rejected a fiscal union. They have resolved to create a banking union, but without a centrally funded resolution authority to bail out uh, or wind up distressed banks, and without a mutually guaranteed deposit protection scheme. So essentially, although you will have a single European system of financial supervision within the ECB doing the monitoring of banks, if a bank gets into trouble, um, then it's not clear where they go. That normally you would then have the central bank with its own balance sheet able to take over a bank and work it out, um, and you'd have a deposit protection scheme that was able to bail out depositors. But if the deposit protection scheme ultimately depends on a sovereign who is itself not viable financially, how does this work? And that's what you've seen in Cyprus, where essentially you've not been able to resolve that problem except by a very large haircut on depositors, which has meant that the Cypriots have had to close their system. So we now do not have a single eurozone. Let's be clear about that. A euro in Cyprus is not worth the same as a euro in Germany. It just isn't. We can't get it out. It's not worth the same. Uh, so we've, it's broken in that sense, um, in the absence of these two other necessary components of a banking union. So in my view, this is still an inadequate response to the Eurozone crisis, and something further will have to be done. And I'm sure that she, and this is the nicest picture, isn't it, <laughs> of Angela Merkel, um, is thinking very hard about it uh, and will think even harder after the German elections uh, in September. Because I think without a resolution of this problem, the EMU crisis will continue to rumble on. So those are my three outstanding items and I leave these uncomfortable truths with you as my farewell to Lithuania. Thank you.